Right. So we um, have this video, and this is again from CAST, so I can't take credit for a lot of these videos. You can find a lot of resources um, through CAST. But this just is a little example of UDL in the classroom um, and how it is designed for all students to have access. But then we want you to kind of pick and, and, and look, at, look around in the video and see what you see as assistive technology being used for all students. So if the sound doesn't work, you should still kind of get the gist of it. I think we do have captions on it available, so. So I'll, I'll pause it right, right there, so, and Annie, you can kind of talk a little bit about that then. Yeah, so as you can see, um, if, you, if you could see the video here, that it was a video of a teacher sharing information about uh, public speaking, and they had a unit on public speaking. It was an area that he was noticing his students were not as strong in, and so he brought up the idea of, well, let's really take a look at this and provide some more opportunities to, to improve on our public speaking and our, and our practice with that. And so it, as part of this process, he allowed um, some unique ways for each of the students to brainstorm and support their work. And so he shared with students, if you have a cell phone, you know how you can use it, you know the school world, but if you have a cell phone and you wanna use that as your tool to brainstorm, Feel free to take that out now and type your notes, use your voice, whatever. Um, so as you can see, when we're talking about universal design for learning, assistive technology, right? Those tools that we think that sometimes we have to design for a student who might be broken or need something special is just something that all students can benefit from. So when the teacher was giving this opportunity for all students, it didn't pinpoint one student as needing something special. It gave all students the opportunity to try something in a different way to support their learning. And then that also goes into the engagement. You saw many students took out their phones to use that. They're so familiar with social, um, for using their phones for social reasons and technology nowadays, that oftentimes they are writing their notes. That's how they are communicating. And if they can use that as a tool to support their learning, why not go for it? Um, I know that not every school has the opportunity to have cell phones out to be able to do um, a task like this, but we like that this video shows that in the sense of, um, how can basic life tools that are around us every day be used in a way that can support our learning? Um, so it's just a really cool little short video. Um, if you want to see it again, it is linked here in the um, in the slides, and it also is captioned, and um, the sound would be on um, if you checked it out yourself. So we love technology. Sometimes it just doesn't work in our I favor, know. right? <laughs> yeah. So I want to take a little bit of time to talk about when we talk about students, you know, oftentimes people are like, oh, it's the average kid in the average classroom and it has a specific learning disability. But I was a teacher of students with um, more significant disabilities, uh, both physical and cognitive. And when we're talking about engagement, we have to engage them, too, because the more that we can get them to do what we want them to do, the more that they will learn and the more that they can become independent. And, you know, and th that's our goal, right? We all want to, to be independent learners and, and do for ourselves something. Well, I had a student many years ago who was very physically challenged. And when we were talking about the set, set process with her mom, so again, and that's the student, the environment, your tasks and your tools. So we talked about the student, what things that she could do and she could reach out and, and touch the switch, but it wasn't her favorite thing to do. You know, because so many of the toys were like, yeah, turn the light on, big deal, or the music played. She wasn't interested. So we had this long conversation with mom and said, okay, what, what is she doing in the home that, that, that shows a smile? You know, where is that engagement piece that you see? And she said, the only time I see her smile is when we're sitting in front of the mirror and I'm doing her hair. And I said, really? And she goes, yeah, she just loves to have her hair done. And it's like, well, let's use that, right? So that was where we started to hook this student. So the thing on the left, if you've never seen that before, is a power link. And a power link allows us to plug anything electrical into it and then plug a switch in. 
So we started with one of these. So we, we put her, put the hair dryer in there with a switch in there. And when she touched the switch, the hair dryer turned on. And so the first time mom, you know, just kind of did hand over hand and then she's blow drying the hair. And we ended up making a, a PVC kind of handle that actually held the hair dryer. So then she was totally independent. She could hit that. And then we started to see her that she'd move her head around and she'd lean in and she did all these cool things. But this was her starting point, folks. This is where we were like, ha, we hooked the kid. We engaged her in this process. And once we engaged her in that and she saw the power that oh, I can sit in the front of the mirror, I can dry my own hair. This is awesome. And this we started to engage her in other things. And we really had thought that the student was quite cognitively disabled. And the more that she was able to do things like this uh, with, with the hair dryer, and then we went to the blender because she actually kind of liked being in the kitchen too. She liked to do things with mom. And, you know, and, and that's how we built upon this. And we found out that the student was probably a lot higher than we all had anticipated. And the engagement between school things and a home things just just became wonderful for her and she was a much happier person because she was involved she was engaged in her everyday activities and then Kathy, you know, i just wanted to say or i just wanted to say i love that you brought in that piece of of that communication with the family right figuring out engagement for kids and connecting um oftentimes we don't know the things that are really engaging at home that can also be used um, for our benefit to help engage students at school. So I love that piece that, you, that just mentioning the idea of how we collaborate with families to, to really help with that engagement too. So Yeah, gr great point. Thanks, Anna, for saying that, that when you are looking at that set process, don't always think about it in the school environment. Like we got to find that hook. Where do we engage that kid? And here's another great example. This was a place where we engaged a student. We had to find the why. Um, I had a student who wanted so badly to call the dog if nothing else just wanted to call the dog but he has spastic cerebral palsy and his movements and stuff i think really frightened the dog and he didn't quite get the idea but of course the, the little boy was so excited because he wanted just to call the dog so then you have all these extra movements so we had a couple of things in there so we had to figure out well he's not using his aac system but he really wants to call the dog so we took one of the squares on his, on his system and actually in the beginning, we, we actually did just a one step, just a very simple communication device. And we had his older brother call the dog. And I have to be careful because mine's sitting over there. So I don't, don't call her <laughs> over here. But um, that, was, that was the engagement part. And then, then the student learned to calm his body down a little bit too. So he would just hit the button and then the, the dog alerted and went over and went right to him. And then he was able to slowly and more purposefully then reach out and pet the dog. But it was the why. It was he didn't understand the function of communication, but he knew he wanted to interact with that dog. And that was the start for him, too, because it went from a one step to um, an eight, uh, like a like a go talk kind of a thing. Actually, it was nine then for the go talk. Um, it went from nine squares to by the time that he left, he was using a uh, 24 uh, grid with a Toby Dynavox. So he was using core vocabulary. But, but folks, we had to start somewhere. If you can't hook that kid, you're never going to get there. So this was the why. This was the hook. You know, and it was an amazing thing. Did it happen overnight? Absolutely not. It took time. And I think we forget about stuff like that. We're like, oh, no, it's got to happen now or never. Nope. Um, think about when we talk about set, there's always that that reset, the RE set process. So just because you did it once doesn't mean you don't do it again, because we have to continually go back because a child changed and his needs changed. And Kathy, I would say this is that's one very fascinating thing that you mentioned too, just that, that persistence with trying things. Um, and uh, even even if in the school environment, you're not seeing the impact right away, because maybe you can't have a dog in the school environment while you're working at all times, right? Um, but really working with that family. And if a family is sharing with you that that's really successful, a lot of times we've got we've to gotta use that to our advantage to help support families um, and students in the school setting too. I don't know how many times I have a, a student who uses an iPad very successfully at home 
comes to school and the team is like, no, they can't use it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it's like, well, something is working at home that's not working here. And what is it? And how can we find that engagement together besides just abandoning it when we haven't really given it a shot? And so really working to give things a fair shot before we abandon that idea or that thought. And there's always something else that we can look for. There's always a motivation. So I love, I love that you mentioned this, Kathy, and I love the picture of the dog there, <laughs> finding that why, right? Making sure that we have that why there. Sometimes it's hard for us to, to find that why, and we're not really sure. So I have linked in here an AAC continuum. Um, it's always good that we have tools to go back to so we can look at them. And this one is actually made by the Toby Dynavox company. Um, so it, it is it is a, uh, a proprietary, if I get the word right. <laughs> it it is, you know, it belongs to them. Let's put it that way. So this yeah. is really nice because it allows us to go through and check boxes. And like on the top here, you see it's ability level emergent. So a lot of the communicators I was talking about were emergent, limited or no understanding of symbols or pictures. So if, if that is your student, then it kind of gives you like a starting point. So you're like, oh, well, our, it did, was their understanding. And you know what? If I showed that student a stick picture of the dog, he had no idea. If I showed him a, a picture of his dog, he was like, oh, I know that one. So, you know, it's like our kids with autism. They look at a picture and they're like, oh, wait a minute. You know, it's context dependent. They're like. This is a dog. This thing over here, not a dog. So we have to help our kids make those connections. So this is a great little checklist for you to go through. And it talks about the social interaction, um, the literacy skills. You know, I didn't know if you have a student who's a non-communicator, how do you know that they're literate? How do you know that they're not literate too? You know, we've talked to a lot of students over the years who uh, became great AAC users and one of the things that they told us that was wonderful is that people read to them so that they learned what words look like and sounded like, and then they became literate. But, you know, it it doesn't happen overnight. We had to find that, that hook and that engagement. And this is kind of a great way for us to go through and say, whoops, maybe they, you know, they're, um, they are not, you know, context, you know, maybe it is context dependent, like I said, with the dog. So that really helps us and figure out where to go and how to get to the next part. And this is I love awesome. that. I have not seen that one, Kathy. So I really like that. Thank you for that resource. You're welcome. You know, you always got to keep digging. And, and that's what our AT Forward project I hopefully is, is that something we know today is going to change tomorrow. So let's let's keep sharing with one another. Yeah. Here's another great example. I had a student who our goal, of course, it was our goal, right? We wanted to increase her breath support because, again, you know, our children who have cerebral palsy or um, other neuromuscular disorders, you know, if we have good breath support, then we feel better. We're able to interact cognitively better. We're able to um, produce better sounds when she could produce sounds on her own. And so here's, here's the team, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, myself, you know, we had a vision person, a bunch of other people got together and we're like, oh, let's, let's put balloons on her stomach and she can watch them rise up and down. Let, let's put weights on her, you know, so she can kind of start to feel that when she takes a breath, it feels like, oh, no. What we needed to do was the fact that she was a typical soon to be teenager and her siblings all love to sit and sing. So if you've never gone to the Tar Heel game player, I did link it in here. Uh, it is a great spot to work on uh, switch activation for kids. And what it does, it allows us to um, actually bring in videos or songs and each switch hit will give you a segment of the song. So we found out that she wanted to, to sing with Carrie, you know, Katy Perry. She wanted to sing with Frozen. And you know what? All of a sudden, her not only her time on task with switch hits just went off the charts, but also her breath support worked more and more because she was like taking a deep breath and she was singing. And grandma said she could hear her in the, you know, three rooms down. But see, this was the why. This was the engagement piece. And this is where it all happened. And yeah, 
you know, we just had to think how, you know, what is it that she wants to do and get that kid engaged? Kathy, can I just ask a question about Tar Heel gameplay? Because I'm curious. Absolutely. Can you actually add, can you add in more of your own music segments and then create your own too? So if you have a student that is really engaged and there's like a new song that just came out, right? You can add your own to this and create like a profile that they would have or an account that they would have be able to save some of this. Is that correct? Yeah, you can not only choose whatever songs or videos, there's a ton that are pre-done, but you can actually create your own and it's super easy. It's just a, a cut and paste and throw it in there. And then you can decide what the prompt will be or how long it will be. You know, because like in the beginning, to me, it's kind of annoying when it's like, hit the switch, hit the switch. Mm. No, more music. Let's do it again. You know, add something like that in there. And then you can actually yeah. make a playlist for your student because then they don't have to keep going through all that. And that help, helps the parents and the and caregivers too. So then it specifies what the child is doing. So yeah, check it out. That. It's a great resource and it's free. I know. And, you know, as educators and when we got kids at home, we want things that are free. Yes, I agree. <laughs> This is not something that's free, but this is also something that has engaged my students so incredibly, the personal assistance. Um, I had a young lady who um, just, just a couple of years ago, she came to us from a foreign country. So she had multiple strikes against her. She had not had any education and she was already in middle school uh, or limited education. She did not speak English. So there was another barrier that we had and she also had not had uh, exposure to so many things. So like when we talk about a microwave and when you look at communication devices, oftentimes things are categorized. So it was categorized in appliance. And she was like, I don't know what an appliance is. And so you have to think about all of those layers of learning that we had to do. But again, we were looking for a way to engage her. And she was a typical kind of teenager when she started to get exposed to different things. She was like, wow, I like this. But her speech, again, was so, so um, not only just dysarthric, but, you know, with cerebral palsy, it was uh, her sounds just did not match anything. And of course, you know, if they're excited or withdrawn or whatever, you're, you don't get the same sounds twice. So we brought in a few personal assistants and found out that mom had an echo dot at home too. And again, this is multiple years of working towards this, but one of the wonderful page sets that like Toby Dynavox has and others are the personal assistants ones. So it will say one box would say, um, you know, Alexa, please play. And then she could choose what she wanted to play and what she wanted to do. And it was incredibly motivating. And, and then it kind of turned into other things. And she's like, well, I have the power to do this. Maybe I can ask for what I want to eat, you know, and not what somebody else puts in front of me when I go through the cafeteria line. So all of these things just kind of snowball for this child. And in a very short amount of time, within less than two years, she was just doing wonderful, incredible communication that we weren't sure that she could do before. But again, it was that engagement piece that personal assistant, it worked wonders.